Bibles to Luke chapter 20. And George, did you take my Bible? Did you take my Bible? <laughs> We're losing it. We're losing it today. <laughs> George would have played for everything. <laughs> Trick-or-treat, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Should be April Fool's. <laughs> Trick-or-treat. Yeah. All right, thank you very much again. And um, let's turn now to uh, Luke chapter 20. And uh, as we continue to understand the uh, parable of the, uh, father, uh, of the uh, vineyard owner whose son ultimately is killed, uh, we are seeing a great picture of God the Father and his provisions for the people and nation of Israel, which they had rejected over and over and over again, uh, culminating with the sending of his son, which they also then uh, killed him off uh, and, uh, uh, to expiate, uh, expedite the process of filling their own pockets with the profit uh, from the harvest. So uh, as we get into this this morning, we get some more interesting principles and precepts uh, to understand. But as we under- also are recognizing is that Jesus Christ, Christ is giving the uh, understanding of where his authority comes from, from this parable, because he just finished the conversation with the Pharisees and the uh, civilian leaders of Israel, where they were questioning his authority. uh, Why, where do you get it from? Uh, Where does it come from? By what authority do you do these things? Jesus Christ refused to answer their question because ultimately they did not answer his question about John the Baptist and where his baptism came from. And so again, we studied that, we understood that, but now Jesus Christ is actually answering their question indirectly as he's speaking to the crowd and uh, giving the understanding of where his authority comes from, and that is from God the Father. So that's what we're talking about in verses 9 through 18, and a little bit of an outline. I did this on Thursday, but just to remind you that the major part of this is the parable about the vineyard owner sending his servants out to reap the harvest uh, in in regard to uh, the vineyard, and then uh, all of them being abused and uh, thrown off without uh, giving them anything. Then he sends his son to reap the reward of the vineyard, but then ultimately they kill off the son so that they could keep the harvest for themselves. After that, then we will understand how God's vengeance will come against those who kill off the Son. So a little bit of prophecy there about the fifth cycle of divine discipline that would come to Jerusalem in 70 AD again. And then finally, we're going to see a message about the stumbling stone, the rock of offense, as it's also called in verses 17 through 18, where Jesus Christ is that stumbling stone that, again, the people of Israel stumbled over time and time again. So as we now turn to this uh, parable in verses 9 through 15, uh, really the first half, of verse 15, is what we're talking about in regard to the vineyard owner and the son uh, being killed off. This is paralleled in Matthew and Mark, as I've also explained, but it also comes from another parable that Isaiah actually wrote about in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, which we noted on Thursday night. We're going to see verse 7 again tonight, or this morning, as it comes into play. But Jesus Christ is playing off of Isaiah's parable and then giving it to the people here to talk about where his authority comes from, but at the same time also giving great other messages uh, for the people and nation of Israel that is really a condemnation of the leaders of Israel because they were not leading the people in holiness and righteousness as they should. Now, just before I read the parable uh, and we get into it, I want to give you the cast of characters here, all right, just to remind you that the vineyard owner is an analogy of God the Father. He is the one who created it. He is the one who made it. He is the one that provided for all of the resources for the vineyard to be made and then ultimately to grow. Then we're going to see that the vineyard itself is Israel, the people and nation of Israel. The vine growers then are the religious leaders and the civilian leaders of Israel who were not doing a good job of growing the nation of Israel in a holy and righteous nation, nor going out and witnessing and evangelizing to the world. We'll talk about that. The servants that are going to be sent, or the slaves as it is, again the Greek word is doulos there for servant or slave, but basically they are the prophets that God had sent to the people of Israel to uh, again warn them, reprove and rebuke them, but also to teach and evangelize. Then 
we also see that the heir or the son in this picture is the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then the last thing that I added was that the long journey that it talks about in verse 9, that long journey is talking about the time from the Exodus generation and then going into the promised land until the first advent of Jesus Christ. So basically God gave them that period of time, which we also call the age of the law, in order to uh, be obedient to the word of God and to uh, fulfill God's plan for them as a client nation unto God. And ultimately, at the second, oh, the, excuse me, the first advent of Jesus Christ, he came back and inspected the whole thing and found them wanting in regard to their responsibilities as a client nation unto God. So we'll get into that in a little bit uh, in just a minute. But in any case, let's go back and read it in Luke chapter 20. <clears throat> As we look at verse 9, and I'll read down to verse 15, it says, He began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and rented it out to vine growers and went on a long journey or went on a journey for a long time. Okay, And again, from the Exodus generation all the way up until the first advent of Jesus Christ. Now, in Matthew and Mark, as I taught on Thursday night, and you can go back and get the detail there as well if you haven't already, they give much more analogy about all these cast of characters that have given you up on the board. They talk more about this and also the construction of the vineyard, talking about God's provision for the people and nation of Israel. And that too goes back to Isaiah's uh, parable in Isaiah 5. So they give a little bit more detail in the opening than Luke does, but he just cuts right to the chase. Now in verse 10 it says, And at the harvest time he sent a slave or a servant to the vine growers in order that they might give him some of the produce of the vineyard. But the vine growers beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he proceeded to send another servant or slave, and they beat him also and treated him shamefully, and sent him away empty-handed. And he proceeded to send a third, and this one also they wounded and cast out. And the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the vine growers saw him, they reasoned with one another, saying, This is the heir. Let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. And then the first half, And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. And then the second part, What therefore will the owner of the vineyard do to them? And again, question mark, and I'll stop there. And as we come back on uh, a Tuesday night, we'll get into the second half of 15, and then also uh, maybe a little bit into 16. But in any case, what we have here is the principles is after delivering uh, Israel uh, from the captivity that they were under in Egypt and bringing them into the promised land, God provided everything necessary for them to be a powerful nation, a unique nation, and certainly a client nation unto him. He given them everything. Again, a land flowing with milk and honey, as it's called. He provided everything for them. And as we also read in the New Testament, and Paul speaking about about the Israelites, how they had the blessings and the promises given to them, the Levitical priesthood, the temple, the sacrifices, the feasts. God gave them everything. He provided everything necessary for them. And as they were wandering in the wilderness for that 40-year time period, remember the sandals of their shoes did not wear out for 40 years. Again, I have a pair of sneakers, and about two years later, i got to get a new pair, okay? 40 years they lasted, the sandals on their feet. He provided them the manner of heaven. Heaven. He provided them uh, the birds when they started to get a little bit upset, having the same food over and over again. He provided the quail and gave them all kinds of provisions. He provided for them everything, every step along the way. Military victory, civil, uh, civility within the society, and all the material blessings and possessions that they needed, especially as they now came into the promised land. But more importantly, you see, most of what I've just mentioned to you are all the material blessings that God had provided, but more importantly, he gave them everything spiritually to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and ultimately to grow in their relationship with God, and to be a fantastic nation, a fantastic client nation unto God, where they could be witnesses to the entire world. And again, I'm not sure if uh, many of you have uh, heard this in the past, but you know there is uh, some evidence, archaeological evidence, 
evidence and also historical evidence that is really kind of hush-hushed a lot of times. But there's a lot of evidence that the Jews came to the Americas before Columbus even got here, okay? Well before. And there's evidence that they were doing that because they were travelers and they were sending people throughout the world and they were evangelizing and witnessing and bringing the God of Israel to the people of the world. So again, they were doing good things with that from a time to time. But as we've seen, over time, they would fall into apostasy. They'd get involved in the false doctrines, the false religions, and then they would turn away and against God. And ultimately, when God did come and sent in his first advent, our Lord saved of Jesus Christ, he found them absolutely wanting for spirituality, and they weren't doing the things that they should have been doing as a client nation unto God, even though he provided them everything necessary to grow and excel as a people and as a nation. And again, I, I emphasize all of that because we look at the United States of America today and how blessed we have been and how many churches there are. Again, you go through any town, especially in New England, okay, and there are at least five to six churches there. And there's probably been another three three or four that have already been torn down over the last hundred years. But initially there were churches after churches after churches, and they were huge, okay? They were huge. And I'm like, how did they fill up those churches? How did they provide for them? And then you look at the structures and the stonework and the brick buildings and all the things, and the money was just there for them. Again, the material blessings were there to build the church. And then you look at it today, and most all of those churches are hurting for people. And then when you have, uh, and, and unfortunately many of those churches today are not teaching the Word of God as they should, but then you have churches like ours that are teaching the Word of God and the truth, and it's, you can barely survive. You can barely keep it going, okay? That's a sad commentary for our nation. But again, God has still provided everything necessary for our people to grow, not only spiritually, but also materially, so that we can be a great client nation unto God. And we have been that, and we continue to be today, even though it seems to be waning more and more each and every day. So again, the warning is kind of out there. But the fact of the matter is God provides, and he provided for the people of Israel every step of the way, physically and spiritually. He's provided for us as a client nation today, physically and spiritually, every step of the way. And he continues to do that today, even though he continues to warn us time and time again. So as we get into the detail, I want to share some other interesting principles that go along with all of that. But in verse 10, let's start there. It says, at the harvest time, he sent a slave, and again, the Greek word doulos, which means a servant, to the vine growers, so that they would give him some of the produce of the vineyard. But the vine growers beat him and sent him away empty handed. Now, what is this owner doing? He's sending his servants, which basically are his ambassadors, okay? His ambassadors, his spokesperson, people that represented him. And when he sent out these servants, or, or these slaves as they would call in the, in the old days as well, as he would send them out, they were endowed with all the authority of their master or of the owner of the vineyard. They were endowed with all that authority. So when they showed up, it was as if the owner too was showing up. And so then we see, okay, how do they treat these individuals, all right? But basically, we see that they rejected the servant ambassadors, as I like to call them. They rejected them time and time again. And so as we talked about in verse 9 and uh, the detail that we see in Matthew and Mark's uh, writing in regard to Jesus' par parable here, we see something even more, that God sent servants. He sent servant ambassadors to the people to teach them, to preach to them, so that they could ultimately learn and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we know him today, but of the Messiah, the Savior, back in the ancient day. So God the Father sent many, many prophets to the people and nation of Israel. Now, in Luke's account, we see in each case, he's only talking about one prophet, or in, in this case, one servant being sent in each uh, instance. But when you read Matthew and Mark's accounts, they have multiple servants being sent each time. So it's not just one servant, or as I'm calling it now, prophet being sent to the people of Israel. There were multiple prophets sent to the people of Israel to teach them and to warn them as well. And God did that, and he provided for that over and over 
over and over again. And so he sent many, many prophets. Here we're just seeing one at a time, one at a time. And when we go back to the Old Testament, we talk about Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel. We could just call out one of those in the great ministry they had for the people of Israel when they were going through apostasy before the destruction of the fifth cycle of divine discipline came upon them. But in any case, what we're talking about are the prophets that God had sent out in the Old Testament, which were his emissaries, his ambassadors that he was sending out. Again, the witnesses and evangelizing uh, to the people and nation of Israel, especially to the religious leaders, so that they would take what they're teaching and give it to the people. But yet, what did we see? Them uh, rejecting them over and over and over again. And unfortunately, especially when they were started on that downward cycle, God would send in the prophet, and it would send in some great message, some powerful message, some eye-opening messages for them to wake up to, but then they would just reject that individual. They didn't want to hear it. They just wanted to keep on with their little you know, fiefdom and their little uh, wickedness that they were living in and ultimately continue to go forward uh, in their own ways, but again, the downward ways of apostasy and uh, reversionism. And as a result, they would not produce divine good. And that's what God was trying th- to get them to do. The harvest that we're talking about is the divine good production that they should be having as a people and a nation, which means witnessing the word of God and evangelizing uh, the people within their own nation and the other nations around them as well. Again, so that uh, other people could come to salvation and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They were sent so that they could repent from their evil and then produce divine good, just as God does for you and I each and every day. He wants us to go forward in His plan. He gives us the information. He warns, reproves, and rebukes us based on the teaching of His Word that we are taking in on a consistent basis so we know what not to do and what things to stop doing if we're doing them, all for the design so that we can produce divine good each and every day and have an impact in our generation and uh, for the people around us as well. But throughout Israel's history, what did they do? They rejected, they rejected, they rejected. Not only did they reject them, but they treated those, uh, those prophets poorly. They beat them and they even killed them and sent them away. Now, in Luke's account, he basically says they were just beaten three times, the three different prophets. And then when the son came, they killed him. And he was doing that for emphasis as well, to focus just on the son that was sent and how he was treated differently. But in Mark's gospel, again, they are recording that these prophets were even killed off, or these servants were even killed off by the evil vineyard growers, or the tenant farmers, as we could also call them as well. So, in any case, we know throughout the history of Israel, how badly and poorly they treated these great prophets of God, even killing them, putting them to death from time to time. And in fact, the the story for Isaiah and his death is that the king of the northern uh, kingdom uh, uh, of Israel ultimately put him in a hollow log and then sawed him in two, and that's how he was martyred. They killed him in that fashion to get rid of him and ultimately destroy him. So these words ring true as to how they mistreated the uh, the messengers that God sent to them. Again, the servant ambassadors that God had sent to the people and nation of Israel throughout their history, trying to get them to repent. And then when it says at harvest time, Again, harvest is in italics because that's not in the Greek word. He just says at the time. And basically uh, what this is talking about is that, you know, when you build a vineyard, okay, you don't get produce in the first year, sometimes not in the second year. And many times, especially uh, uh, grapevines, it takes three years before you are going to get produce from that vine. So you've got to be patient. You've got to give it some time. And so you've got to give it a little uh, time to grow, a little time to flourish, and to, and to grow up and be strong, have the appropriate strength, and then it can produce fruit. So God wasn't there expecting right away, produce, 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 produce. No, he gave them a little bit of time. He provided for them all along. He gave them everything necessary, physically and spiritually, so that they could grow in the knowledge of God and in their relationship with God. And then at the time when they should be producing fruit, which means they grew to spiritual maturity and spiritual adulthood, 
Then he sent the prophets to say, what do you have in return? What do you have and what have you produced at this time? So again, at the harvest time is basically just talking about God going to inspect the people from time to time to see where they were after providing them everything necessary to be the great client nation unto God as they should be. Where they are winning souls of the lost and growing and edifying the souls of the believer. So again, when we talk about the harvest time, we could even say all the way down to the first advent of Jesus Christ. And that's when he truly came to inspect the people and nation of Israel. He was on a journey for a long time. Then he came back at this point in time when he sent his son. Now, prior to sending his son, he sent the first servant, the second servant, the third servant, and then he sent his son, ultimately as the fourth uh, ambassador for the owner to see what they had done. Now, it's interesting when we also compare in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 7, in the second half, what was God looking for when he sent his servants and then sent his son after they uh, abused the servants and sent them away empty-handed? Well, what we see in the book of Isaiah is that God is looking for righteousness and justice. And I find that fascinating because righteousness and justice is talking about what? The completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross in the payment of the penalty of our sins. And when we talk about the righteousness and justice of God, we're talking about his plan of salvation for mankind and what he, that he has given us salvation. And then as we have or accept his salvation, now we are to do what? Walk in the righteousness and justice of God. And again, when we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And why does he do that? So that we can walk in the righteousness and justice of God once again. And it's kind of interesting, too, that uh, both in the Hebrew and in the Greek, you can have different words for righteousness and justice, but the same words are also very synonymous as well. And they're almost interchangeable, which means they're really talking about one thing and how they come together. And again, in the integrity of God, His righteousness and justice providing everything necessary so that we can grow uh, in uh, our relationship with Him. So when we talk about this, we're talking about the positional and the experience experiential sanctification that they should have within their souls. Positional sanctification, talking about salvation, winning the lost souls, and then experiential sanctification, those who are saved walking in the knowledge of God each and every day, where they then are doing what? Producing divine good, the fruit of the Spirit. So Basically, that's what their uh, God was coming back. That's what he was looking for. He wasn't looking for how many castles did you build? How many armies did you defeat? How good is your economy? Who are your political leaders today? Like, again, when you read, and as we've gone through the Gospel of Luke, and you compare that with the other uh, Gospel accounts, how little Jesus Christ focused on what? The civilian leaders. He didn't care about the governments. I mean, the, the biggest thing he said about the government was, render unto Caesar what is Caesar, render unto God what is God's. He did not care that the Romans uh, were occupying and the rulers of Israel at that day, per se. That wasn't the issue. The issue isn't who are your leaders in the political realm. The issue is what's going on in your spiritual life. And am I seeing righteousness and justice in your spiritual life? Am I seeing salvation? Am I seeing you walk in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? That's what he comes back to inspect. Now, the fact is, is that if you are operating in justice and righteousness and you are growing spiritually, that is going to be reflected in your society. And your political leaders will reflect what is coming from the soul of the majority of the people especially in a voting country like we have in the United States of America. But if you don't have righteousness and justice in the soul of believers, or many of the citizenry because they haven't even become believers, then your political leaders and your society is going to reflect that too. It won't have justice and righteousness in it. It will be unjust and unrighteous in its operation and in its procedures. But the fact of the matter is what's the most important thing is the spiritual realm. And that's what Jesus Christ came to focus on. Later on, he's going to come back and establish the perfect kingdom with a perfect civilian government with him ruling it, 
But the most important thing in his first advent, what's going on in your souls? And how are you utilizing the provisions of God to win souls and to grow souls each and every day? And so again, as he inspected Israel in this sense, he is inspecting you and I in that sense as well, because we too have that same responsibility to win souls and to grow souls once they are saved. But instead, what Jesus Christ Christ found in his first advent was really the rejection of God and his will and his plan for the people and ultimately them getting involved in all kinds of false doctrines and then what we also call pagan doctrines and really any false doctrine even though you may say the name Christ or say the name God you can be a false pagan religion because you've totally you know uh, turned it upside down or system of works or maybe you've got uh, co-regents of uh, you know people that you're praying to or other saints that you're praying to or other gods or whatever the case may be but that's what Israel had fallen into they totally twisted the word of God and many times they were getting in the false God worships or combining them and blending that and saying, oh, it's just all one thing. OK. And again, uh, you know, some of the major denominations within the world today have blended pagan religion. Again, today's a holiday. We're talking about Halloween. It's a blend of pagan religion and Christianity. I won't go into the detail because I've got more important things to talk about. But again, do your own studies on that. But in any case, it's not what we are to be doing. Blending the pagan with the truth because then it becomes all false. They had got involved in false doctrines and they weren't now about saving souls and growing people in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, in the poetic sense in Isaiah 5, 7, thus he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. And the Hebrew word there also talks about law-breaking, bloodshed. Again, we talk about murder or attempted murder, that egregious. And basically, it's what? The murder of the soul. You're not winning souls. You're not giving life to the soul. You're allowing it to stay dead spiritually because you're not witnessing and evangelizing. That's what he found. And then for righteousness, but behold, cries of distress. Again, moaning, wailing, the aching. Again, the sorrow. And it's funny that as uh, much as people don't want God in their life, and the more we push God out of our life, what happens? The more sorrow comes into life and into the society. And the more people are hurt, the more people are wanting, the more people are crying out. And it's funny, they cry out for justice, justice, justice. But they don't cry out for God, 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 God. But if they had God in their life, they wouldn't have to have the distress and the mourning. They would have the inner peace and joy and happiness and the provisions of God in every aspect of their life. And in fact, in the uh, notes that I gave you, there's a good play on words here because it says for justice, but instead law breaking or bloodshed. In the Hebrew, it's in, you know, the, he was looking for mishpat, but he found mishpak. Okay, so again, a good rhyming there. And then when it says looking for righteous, but instead he found the crying or the distress. Again, we have sedek, and then we have sedeach. Okay, so again, a little bit of rhyme on words in the Hebrew as you read it there in the poetic sense that this is. But basically, he was looking for righteousness and justice in the hearts of the souls, and what he found was just the opposite of that, and the results of not having righteousness and justice. And again, I'm not talking about political or social righteousness or justice. Okay, I'm talking about spiritual righteousness and justice that's what god was looking for were they saved did they have the means of salvation were they preaching and teaching it and then were they teaching the greater doctrines of the word of god and growing in the grace and knowledge of our lord and savior jesus christ as we call him but god their father or or a jehovah elohim so what did the what did the vine owner do he sent a slave to the vine growers and as we've talked about these are the servant ambassadors for god in analogy and that's what he sent out and all those prophets who were servant ambassadors for god to evangelize to teach to preach to reprove and to rebuke he sent them great prophets and we've got a whole old testament book filled of those great prophets <clears throat> and the work that they had for God to teach and preach, evangelize, and to warn the people. And we've got all that information. But yet we see them treating just about every single one of them horribly, and many times even putting them to death. They abused them, 
and they persecuted them over and over and over again. So, again, should we be surprised if we are persecuted each and every day, as we now, in the church age, are the royal ambassadors for God? You see, back in the day, he would send the prophet. Now he's sending every single one of us, every member of the body of Christ, which means every believer has been entered into the uniqueness of being not only a royal priest, but also a royal ambassador. And you compare Ephesians 6.20 and 1 Peter 2.9, we are royal ambassadors for God. And we are also called throughout the New Testament, what? The servants of God, the slaves of God, as it were, the doulosses. We are his servants, and we are the servant ambassador that is representing our sovereign. And we are representing God our Father. And we are here to do that each and every day. And so, again, as God sent that to the people and nation of Israel throughout their history, especially when they were on the downward cycle, God is continuing to do that in our day and age, whether we're on the upward trend or downward trend, but he's creating all of us as servant ambassadors to evangelize, to witness the word of God to those who need it, those who are without salvation, and so that the believer can grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have the same purpose today. But just think about it. And as we think about, you know, the, the one or two prophets that he would send back in the days of Israel compared to all the people that they had. If we are in a downward spiral as a client nation unto God, that means there are less believers in the nation. And certainly of those believers, less that are mature in their soul who can wield the word of God in a proper way. There are less and less of those people. That's what we call the shrinking of the pivot. And so therefore, if you've got less and less and less and less of that, you've got less opportunity for people to hear the word of God and to receive the word of God. But yet, God is continuing to provide. And God provided those servant ambassador prophets right up into the time of their fifth cycle of divine discipline. And some of them actually went into captivity along with the people. Because God provided to witness to them over and over and over again. And God does that for our nation too. And he continues to provide, and he'll continue to provide pastor teachers who are teaching the right word so that the, every individual believer who is listening and growing from that pastor teacher can ultimately be the royal ambassador that God has designed them to be. And they can be the witnesses and the evangelists uh, to a, a, a world uh, that can be going down in, in apostasy. So again, God always provides. He will never stop providing uh, for the people to witness the word of God, and he will never stop uh, you know, giving them opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to repent and then ultimately produce divine good. And so why did he send his servant ambassador? So that they would give him some of the produce of the vineyard. And again, plain and simple, that produce of the vineyard is divine good production and all the means and modes and operations that we can produce divine good. And again, for you and I, we first produce divine good within our own soul when we take in the Word of God and we apply the Word of God consistently and then we operate in that Word of God. We are producing divine good as we execute God's plan for our life. And then as we do that, now we're affecting the lives of other people. And we're witnessing or we're uh, 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 teaching uh, believers or we're uh, utilizing our spiritual gift to support the church in some form or fashion so that the Word of God can be preached. You see, that's our divine good production. And we do it with ourselves. I would then say secondly, within our families. And then thirdly, into our community. And that's how we should be utilizing the divine provisions that God has given to us materially and spiritually so that we can produce divine good and have divine good production where not only are we walking in fellowship and holiness and righteousness, but we're sharing that with other people. Whether they receive it or not is something else, but again, giving them the opportunity to repent and believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior, and if they've already done that, to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So that is our responsibility today, and God is now sending you and I out into that missionary field, as it were, and wherever that is, within your own family first, within your community second, then maybe your state, then maybe your nation, then maybe internationally if that is God's plan for you. 
But God wants you to be producing divine good. And one day, as I said on uh, Thursday night, and as you all are very familiar, one day we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ called the Bema Seat, and our works are going to be judged. And God is going to say, what did you do with all the things I gave to you to produce divine good? What did you do with all those provisions? Did you just live for yourself in a nice little uh, uh, happy life over there and uh, somewhere up on a hill uh, where nobody could touch you? Or were you ultimately witnessing the Word of God to the people around you, within your family, within your community, and then maybe broader than that in some form or fashion? What did you do with what I provided for you? And we're all going to have to have an account for what we did. Unfortunately for the people of Israel, as the Son came back, Jesus Christ, again, He was taking that account. And that was the same thing. What have you done with everything that's been provided? And they demonstrated clearly what they did. And it certainly wasn't divine good production, and it was nothing but wickedness and evil. So God ultimately destroyed them and wiped them out and held them accountable for their lack of production, as it were, even after providing for them over and over and over again. So by sending out his ambassador prophets, he expected to find a prophet. Do you see those playing words right there? Okay, pretty good, huh? He sent out his prophets to get some return so he would have a prophet okay and so basically god too is a businessman all right and again he's not an evil businessman but he's all for business okay never think that god's not for business okay he's all for business because he too is looking for a return on his investment but it's not inordinate and it's not a gluttony he's just looking what did you do with what i gave you what did you do with all the resources and materials I provided? So as he provided the ambassador prophets, he was expecting to have some profit. He was looking for souls to be one. He was looking for believers to become mature. That's what God is looking for. That's the profit he's looking for. And in essence, all, as we also understand, when that happens, all the glory goes to him. Why? Because he provided everything necessary for that to happen, including his son Jesus Christ upon the cross. Just as the vineyard owner provided all the materials necessary for the vineyard to produce a crop and have a profit, as it were. And so therefore, the owner should be reaping of that profit. And oh, by the way, if you also recognize the full analogy, the vine growers, they kept their share. They were the tenant farmers, and they probably kept a majority of the profit. And only a portion of that profit would go back to the owner. That was his return on investment. That was the agreement that they would make. But the vine growers would get the majority of the profit, just like you and I are going to get majority of the blessing in the eternal state. Even though God is glorified, we're going to get fantastic blessings when we produce divine good in the eternal state. If we have produced that divine good during our time here on planet earth but unfortunately these vine growers they wanted it all they wanted it all they didn't just want the small portion uh, or the majority portion that they were receiving they wanted it all let's get rid of the air so we have it all so again we see the uh, evil and wickedness in the heart of these vine growers those who were given the responsibility to tend to the vineyard those given the responsibility to tend over the client nation called Israel. And then it says but the vine growers beat him and sent him away empty handed. And again uh, in, in all of this when we talk about the beating again we talk about the physical abuse that they uh, brought onto this individual and then they just sent him away nope we're not giving you anything you get out of here. So they persecuted these individuals and they sp uh, banished them without any spiritual gain. And that's what they did to the prophets of Israel when they would come to Israel. They would Again, abuse them, they would beat them, they would reject them, and then they'd send them away. And there would be no gain. Why? Because they didn't receive the gain that they should have had. They should have received much gain. And unfortunately for these poor prophets, again, they should have reaped much benefit and reward for what they had done. The people should have hailed them as, uh, as victors, as it were. 
Again, you have changed our nation. You have provided more for our nation. You've provided for our people. You've provided for our spirituality and our salvation through your message. But yet they sent the prophets off empty-handed. That's why you read in the, in the Old Testament, none of these guys ended up rich and, you know, and, uh, you know uh, set up on a throne. Okay? They all ended up very poor and banished you know, from society. And, when, and we're going to see this in just a minute, but when you think about John the Baptist, again, wearing camel skins for clothing, eating uh, locusts dipped in honey, okay, and then beheaded at the end, okay? He wasn't set up in a perch somewhere on, on, a, on a hill where he was now the king of the world or, you know, somebody that is held in high regard and honored. No. They beat him and they banished him and said, we don't want anything to do with you. So, the, uh, you know, this all represents also what we're talking about here in verse 10, the first attempt of God sending his uh, a servant ambassadors to the people to help them to rebound and recover, to repent from their ways and get back into righteousness so they could produce divine good. So when we talk about the number one within the Bible, it talks about unity. So God sending his ambassadors all about the unity. He wanted this to be an opportunity for the people to unite with God once again. And in his grace, his mercy, his justice, his righteousness, and his love, that's what he wants. He wants that unity with the people. They would re repent and then ultimately recover and get back into a relationship with him. But now, as we uh, know, they rejected those individuals. So in regard to rejecting it, the owner doesn't say, well, forget it. I'm not sending anybody else. I'm just going to leave it. I'm going to forget about it. Nor does he say, I'm going to send in an army to destroy it. He says, let me send somebody else. Let me send a second person. And now in the second attempt that we have here in verse 11, and interesting enough, the number two talks about division or separation, okay? Now he's trying to give the evidence. And remember in the Lord, it says you need two witnesses to convict anybody, okay? This is the second witness that he's sending, the second prophet. He didn't just send one, now he's sending two. And this proves their division, their willful separation from God by rejecting him too. And so that's why the second one gets sent, to show their guilt. But it also shows what? The love that God has in his heart. The grace, mercy, love, and the long-suffering. Again, he waited and he waited, and he sent and he sent. He provided and he provided, hoping for repentance, rebounding, and recovery, but he still does not find it. As it says in verse 12, and he proceeded to send a, th excuse me, and he proceeded to send another slave, and they beat him also, and treated him shamefully, and sent him away empty handed. So what we see in, in verse 11 is more of the same. The beating and sending away empty-handed, but now we see something else, that they treated him shamefully. And they treated him in such a way, and again, this word means with dishonor and disrespect. It's kind of an interesting Greek word. It's a tamazo, as I show you up on, on the board. The root word is tamao. And tamao uh, does mean to honor or to respect, but it also means to set a price to pay for something, okay, and to make it of great value. So it's kind of interesting that we see a word that ties into the paying of the price, okay? But then we have the Greek negative A at the beginning, and if you have the prefix A in the beginning of a word, it makes it a negative thing. And so we have the sense of paying a price for the head of these individuals, as we, they did with Jesus Christ for 30 pieces of silver, but all of that represents how they dishonored him, disrespected him, and treated him shamefully. Just as they did with these other servant ambassador prophets that were sent to the people of Israel. This is how they were treated. So as someone treats the ambassador, the point is, as someone treats the ambassador of the sovereign, so too are they treating the sovereign. And that goes for the United States of America, okay? And if we send an ambassador to a foreign country and they were to abuse that ambassador, that's almost a declaration of war against the United States of America, who they are representing. And so as they treat our ambassadors today, so too is how they treat us as a country today. 
And over the millennia, many a war has been ignited because of the ill treatment of the ambassador. Because they represent the sovereign. And so all these prophets that were sent to the people and nation of Israel who were beaten, sent away empty-handed, and treated shamefully, so they treated the ambassador, so true were they see treating the sovereign. In other words, that's how they treated God, in the mentality of their soul. He wasn't there to physically beat him. He wasn't there to shoo him out of town. He wasn't there to disrespect, although you know, literally in spirit they did disrespect him, they did dishonor him, but they also beat him and shamed him and sent him away empty-handed. And so, again, when they treat the ambassador, the servant ambassador that way, that's how they're treating God too. And as we know, every one of you are a royal ambassador of God. And so the country treats you, or so the people treat you. So they are treating God. And again, also recognize that you're not here to represent yourself. You're here to represent God. So if they treat you poorly, it's not that they're treating you poorly. Always have in your mind's eye, that's how they're treating God. And again, it takes you right out of the equation. You don't have to get all uptight about it. You don't have to feel bad about it. You don't have to get self-conscious about it because they're not treating you that way. They're treating God that way because you are his ambassador. So again, that should give you greater confidence and strength to go forward. And again, sticks and stones can break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Okay, it bounces off you, bounces, it bounces off me, bounces off you, it sticks to you. Uh, however that goes, okay? Don't let it bother you, okay? Do not let it personally bother you and do not get a complex about it because they're not treating you that way. You're just the ambassador and they're treating your sovereign, who you represent, that way and that's who they're treating. And have that heart because in that, now you've got a heart that really hurts for God and maybe that will embolden you even more to go out and serve your God even more and more and more. And double down on your efforts as you are representing the sovereign. So again, never worry about how they're treating you. Because they rejected the prophets, they rebused the prophets, so they did the same to God their Father, their Savior, their Creator, and their Provider. Just think about that. This is who God is. Their Savior, their Creator, their provider, and you could put a whole bunch of other adjectives on there. That's who God is. And he's a faithful one too. And he will never stop providing and caring and creating and saving. He will never stop. He will continue day after day after day, even through all the abuse and rejection that the people have towards him because he is a faithful God. So uh, they treated the owner's representatives poorly, just as they also would to Jesus Christ, as we see in the last one. We'll get to that more on Tuesday night. But again, including the price on the head, as I said, because these wicked vine keepers had no respect for their master's authority or power. And that goes back to what Jesus Christ was talking about with the Pharisees. You know, where's your authority from? Where's your authority from? But what authority do you do these things? You know, one of the reasons he didn't answer them, because they didn't respect their God. And because their God had given him his authority and power, they weren't going to respect him either. If they're not respecting God, why would they respect the ambassador? Why would they respect him too? And again, that was the whole point. But yet, the message was clear, and the message was given. Let's get to the, uh, uh, the third one, and we'll end with the third one this morning. It says, and they proceeded to send a third. And this one also they wounded and cast out. So we see a little bit of change in the, uh, in the terminology, but more of the same, but a little bit more intense here. You see, they, they beat and sent away empty-handed the first guy. They beat, sent away empty-handed the second guy. Plus, they cheated, uh, treated him shamefully, disrespectfully, dishonorably. Now, in the third, they wound and they cast out. A little bit of intensification of now the latest prophet. And this is God's third prophet, which is the number of divine perfection and completion. And again, this is enough. This is complete. This is all I need. This is all the information you need. And again, it was his divine perfect plan and will to attempt to lead them out of their apostasy into repentance and into recovery. Now, when we talk about three, this, this is also a great parallel. 
because you had a northern kingdom, went into apostasy, wiped out by the Assyrians. You had a southern kingdom, later went into apostasy, wiped out by the Babylonians. Now you have the current nation of Israel that Jesus came to visit, forerun by John the Baptist, who they rejected. And now Israel, as a nation in 70 AD, is being wiped out. And they have remained wiped out as a client nation unto God until his second advent. Kind of interesting. Divine completion, now you're done. And so again, we see a great correlation. I sent the first, I sent the second, I'm sending the third. The northern kingdom, they didn't wake up and repent. The southern kingdom, they didn't wake up and repent. They both went out under the fifth cycle of divine discipline. The current nation that Jesus was witnessing to, they too didn't wake up at the wisdom and words of John the Baptist, the greatest prophet of all time. And they too would be wiped out in 70 A.D. and lose their client nation status until the second advent of our Lord Jesus Christ, which has been over 2,000 years or just about to be 2,000 years in the making. So the third again also points to John the Baptist as the greatest of all prophets according to Jesus in Luke chapter 7, verse 28. So again, they sent the first, they sent the second, now they're sending the third. Again, this is also going back to Jesus' Uh, conversation with the uh, leaders, where did John the Baptist get his authority to baptize from? Was it from man or was it from God? So again, he's pointing right back to John the Baptist with this third now. You've already gone under twice. You're about to go under a third time. I'm giving you an opportunity to repent, rebound, and recover. But yet they did not. And in 70 AD, again, they too were wiped out like their predecessors. So when we talk about wounded, this is an interesting word, traumatizo. And uh, that's where we get our word traumatized from or trauma. So in this word wounded, we both have the physical wound of a trauma when you break your arm or you get a, 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 you know, a big cut or a gunshot, whatever the case may be. It's a trauma, okay? But then we have the word traumatize. And what is that? That's mentally. That's spiritually. That's soulishly. So this word wound speaks to both of those things. This is how they treated their prophets. They abused them physically, but also mentally, as it were. Spiritually, as they rejected them time and time again. We also have, again, the culmination of what we've seen already of the shameful and the beating and the sending away of empty-handed. We see all of that here. They were traumatized, as it were physically and spiritually, or tried spiritually, but again, because they were great men of God, they stood the course, okay? But boy, oh boy, what a weight on their souls it must have been to be rejected and abused by your own people when you are speaking the truth of God's Word. How traumatizing was that to them? Just as it can be traumatizing to you, and that's why I said, you're the ambassador, and they're not attacking you, they're attacking your sovereign. So don't, don't let their attack that is designed to traumatize you, don't let it be traumatic in your life. Because it should not be. Because they're attacking your sovereign, not you. So again, don't let their wounds uh, take uh, uh, effect. Don't let their wound sink in. And then we have the word cast out, which is also interesting, which is ekbalo. It means to throw out, to drive out, to send out. Again, this represents the absolute rejection. It's more than just sending away empty-handed, okay? They drove him away, drove him out, get rid of this guy. We don't want to hear anything from them whatsoever. And they pushed him right out. Just as we're seeing God pushed out of our society today in more and more realms. But hopefully there's a revival and we can get back to that where God is in our society once again. But didn't they cast out Jesus Christ and drove him out of the city when they crucified him? They sent him away. They drove him out. This word is used in two uh, 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 interesting fashions in the Gospels. One is when Jesus Christ was casting out demons. Okay, So again, they treated the apostles like a demon and casting them out. As Jesus cast out the true evil out of the souls of these individuals when they were possessed by these demons. The other casting out is then the casting out of God where he warns in the Gospel of Matthew, casting the unbeliever out into what? The outer darkness. I will cast you into the outer darkness. 
And basically that's talking about hell. Where he will cast them out. And all the unbelievers who rejected God throughout all the, the millennia who were given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, they will be the ones finally cast out into the outer darkness into, again, the eternal lake of fire. But as we see, you know, in our day, evil is good and good is evil. They were taking the good prophets, the servant ambassadors of God, and they were treating them like evil, wicked, rotten individuals, and they would cast them out. And again, that's how a society that is in apostasy treats the people of God. And so again, don't be surprised. Don't be shocked. Don't, you know, be traumatized by it. If people treat you illly, if that's a word, okay, if they treat you poorly, okay, and they try to again abuse you or abuse, again, what you are speaking about. Don't let it bother you. Because again, it's only the roaring lion. The Satan ro uh, roams around like a roaring lion. Not a devouring of a lion. They can't devour you because you have a soul. You have eternal life. You have God in you. They can't destroy you. So again, don't take it personally, but take it understanding the representation of your sovereign. And that's how they're treating him. That's how they're treating him as they treat you. So remember in all of this, we have the great message. God was willing and continues to be time and time again to go the extra mile. Time and time again, he would do and provide and willing to go above and beyond, even when they deserved it after the second prophet went. Second prophet, you've got two witnesses. That's enough to convict. He still sent a third, and then he sends a fourth, his own son. God continued to try. And provide, he did, as he continues to try and provide for our nation to be a client nation, to maintain that client nation status. But with the expectation that we have divine good production, with the expectation that there is a produce that comes from all that he has provided. And he has the expectation of that reasonable behavior to receive his just due, that we win souls and we edify souls of those who have believed. Yet for those who reject his ambassadors and his provisions time and time again, again, he will continue to be faithful, but at some point he says enough is enough. Enough is enough. And if the apostasy is rampant, he'll go on and bring up another client nation unto himself. So again, what we have to recognize is the long-suffering, the patience, the grace, mercy, and love of our God who provides and provides and provides physically and spiritually so that his ambassadors can have success in producing divine good to a lost and dying world. And that's how we should be operating each and every day, knowing that we are here to represent our sovereign and to have a return on investment, which means souls and lives that we are winning for God each and every day, starting with our own, getting into our families, getting into our communities and into our societies and do it with all the provisions that God has given you. All right, so uh, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. And we thank you for your patience and your long suffering and your grace and mercy to send time and time again and even on, in, in our own personal lives, Father, to help to wake us up from the sin or uh, evil that might creep into our lives, to help us to wake up from that so that we don't go down that wrong path and continue to walk in your holiness and righteousness. And Father, we just ask that you lead us to be better ambassadors unto you each and every day for your glory and for the benefit of the people who are around us. So, Father, we thank you for our time and, uh, and this time, and we ask that you lead us in the closing portions of our service. In Christ's name, amen. All right, thank you very much, and uh, now we'll have uh, Deacon Barry come forward, and uh, we'll uh, uh, partake of an offering. And as I uh, mentioned last week, um, uh, again, need the uh, at least one, maybe two computer monitors, and if anybody can help out in there, and I know some people have uh, uh, mentioned it, but um, uh, hopefully we can make that happen. Okay, now for the good news, uh, not really, but uh, we, we had, uh, we've had a light month, so uh, 
I pray and ask that if you consider yourself part of this congregation, whether you're here physically or online, that you continue to support this church in the uh, financial requirements that uh, are upon us. So let us pray for our offering. Lord, we pray that you continue to bless our church and keep your hand upon us and move us to, uh, to give offerings as needed and required to meet our financial obligations. Through Christ we pray with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.